I'm James Hannigan and I've been working in games for going on 15 years. Um, at the moment I'm working on Deathly Hallows Part 2 um, and so obviously the most recently completed game is uh, Deathly Hallows Part 1. I started out working um, in television and uh, library music and this is sort of the early to mid 90s uh, and then I became aware of um, games music uh, as a gamer you know I, I played games um, I've been playing games most of my life I was probably sort of one of the um, I sort of belong to the generation that first started uh, playing games as you know as a child so I was very familiar with um, the the industry as a whole and the aesthetics of games music and um, as digital audio came into games I sort of saw the potential to um, get involved in uh, the newer forms of production that were uh, entering into the games industry because prior to that a lot of music had been uh, chip music you know music that's created using the underlying hardware um, uh, within the consoles themselves and a lot of it was MIDI based as well so um, digital audio came in um, sort of early to mid 90s so it was possible to stream almost anything um, within a game you know it could be streamed from CD or hard disk so it really opened things up uh, in terms of what you could actually place in a game and I think that appealed to me a great deal at the time so um, I sent uh, a demo tape to uh, Electronic Arts and a few other companies um, see, people didn't really send CDs or MP3s then, it just, you know, generally a little cassette tape. Um, and I was offered a job in-house at Electronic Arts. And I was based there for a couple of years, working on uh, various EA Sports games um, and other games that went through the studios, like um, Privateer, The Darkening, Space Hulk, things like that. And before that, uh, I mean, I had scored a few games uh, or had involvement with um, other games, games like uh, Warhammer, Shadow of the Horned Rat, which was um, one of the first um, PlayStation games. Well, it's a bit of a cliche, but it was the piano, you know. <laughs> it always seems to be piano. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been playing the piano for as long as I can remember. So making music, uh, came very naturally to me and composing as well. I never really separated the process of improvisation uh, with learning to play uh, other people's music. It always seemed to go together for me, so I'd spend half my time um, studying and uh, building my repertoire of you know existing music, but uh, spending, you know, uh, the rest of my spare time improvising and composing so it's it's you know composing has been part of my life forever really I'd like to be able to play everything <laughs> um, I mean I do experiment with um, instruments I mean very often if I'm after a certain sound I'll obtain an instrument and not necessarily learn to play it but I'll sort of become proficient enough to make a few interesting sounds and record them and you know manipulate them and work them into the music somehow um, you know any instrument I mean is there an instrument that I'd really like to know well I suppose guitar yeah I'd like to be a better guitarist I think it's probably the moment when I first managed to sell some of it to be honest I mean <laughs> I know it doesn't sound um, particularly um, I don't know a uh, pure way of looking at music but um, uh, yeah I think when I started selling library music and finding that I could actually place my music in a commercial context and have it out there you know played on adverts and even sort of radio jingles, that kind of thing. I mean, initially that was, that was very exciting because it really spurred me on. It made me realize that I could make a living out of this. So I think that's probably, yeah, it was that, that sort of turning point 
when I realized that um, what had been a hobby, in a way, um, really was starting to become a viable career for me. I've always been interested in games and I had a fascination with games music, I mean, a, quite a geeky fascination. And I think that, you know, uh, the reason so many people enjoy early games music, I think, does come out of a kind of geeky, uh, geeky desire to know how it was created. So it's more than just the music, it's this sort of, there's this question of well, how is it possible, you know, how do you get this sound out of a little console, you know, with, especially with chip music. So I suppose it was that that sort of got me interested in it. I just wanted to have a go at it, to sort of curiosity, how do you get music in a game? Because I think that's probably a mystery to a lot of people even today, you know, it's how do you actually place this music in a game? So I think that that was probably what um, motivated me to try um, to, to get involved. Um, so I, I, I got involved with a composer called Richard Joseph, who unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago. Um, and I did some bits and pieces for some of the games that he was working on. And it went from there, really. This is tricky, um, because there are so many reasons to like music in games. You know, this, it sort of operates on so many different levels. I mean, you've there's a sort of idea recently that uh, good games music is, uh, particularly in the West, um, that it, it, that's how it's somehow synonymous with music that sounds like film music. So if you look at it in those terms, then you'd say, well, these composers are good because they sound like film composers. But then if you go back further than that, you know, uh, listen to old um, Mario games, they have a completely different aesthetic, there's a different language, it's very sort of unique games-based music, but I find that equally interesting. So, I don't know, I think when it comes to composers, and we're talking about sort of filmic music, um, I'm probably more inspired by film composers if I'm really honest about it. But when it comes to games composers, it probably it is a case of going back a bit further. Um, Koji Kondo, I think, it is the Mario. I hope I pronounced his name correctly, but um, I think he does the Mario games, and I think you know, it's just music is so appropriate for those games. It just works uh, with the visuals, and it's fun, and it, it, you know, it's just it's perfect. Um, Nobuo Numatsu uh, is the Final Fantasy games. He's very good. I think in the UK, um, I like Richard Jakes. I think he's a very good composer. Um, that's about. You know, those are the people that come to mind. I'm sure I can think of a few more, given time. Not as much as I'd like to. Um, and the reason for that is that it's actually, you know, as a composer, it's actually very difficult to get time to listen to music. Um, I mean, if, you know, if you've been spending the whole day in a studio <coughs> mixing uh, or sort of monitoring music, you, you tend to get um, ear fatigue so the last thing you want to do at the end of the day is listen to more music. And a lot of, you know, a lot of composers have said this to me, and engineers, as it happens. Um, so it's, it's getting the time. Um, but in between projects, I do try to take in um, new music or go back to some old favorites. I mean, my tastes are very, very eclectic. So it's difficult to single any one thing out. But you know, I like classical music, contemporary, serious music, jazz, electronica, anything that's interesting and, you know, well-constructed or emotionally engaging, intellectually engaging. Again, I think, it, you know, it really comes down to each project. I mean, if you're sort of brought on board, as I often am, to, uh, to work with an orchestra and to create this sort of filmic music, um, then, you know, the frame of reference or the inspiration sort of stylistic direction is most likely to be determined by uh, the film music language, if you like. So, composers like Jerry Goldsmith, Bernard Herrmann, John Williams, uh, Nicholas Rosa, I mean, those are the, um, 
usual suspects. Um, but uh, you know, as I say, you know, if I'm doing a, a racing game, it'll be, you know, Bortecker or something like that. It'll be somebody completely, um, you know, from a completely different background. It's entirely, you know, I, I see every project as requiring a different approach to music. None that I'm allowed to talk about, you know, the usual NDA situation. Um, but I think it's safe to say that I'm, you know, I'm working on Deathly Hallows Part 2. Um, I have started work on an action-adventure game, but uh, I'm not allowed to say what it is, or even who it's for. <laughs> A few years ago, I'd probably have suggested that it was very important to understand the underlying technology and interactive music and how music gets implemented and that kind of thing because composers used to be a lot more involved in that sort of technical implementation as the industry tends to call it um, you know actually you know getting the music to function in in the game I mean some composers I think still do it they you know they actually code the, the playback system so but I think that's a lot less important now than it used to be um, because you know there's usually an audio programmer or someone who get their hands dirty with the, the music system and edit the music and actually place it in the game. But I still think that it's important to understand some of the differences between games and other linear media forms. You know, I think it's probably a mistake to assume that um, you can just write the music you want to write and just place it in the game and it's going to function. I think you have to be aware of how important it is to not only I mean, you have to be able to write the music, but you also have to be able to prepare it for the playback system uh, and edit it and get it ready to uh, actually work in context. That could mean, you know, delivering music in stems or having layered versions, of, uh, you know, different uh, layers that can be brought in and out of the mix in real time in the game or uh, music that loops, so you have to sort of, I mean that affects the delivery of the music, the way you actually play the music back in game does have an effect on how you approach writing the music. So I suppose being aware of that's quite important um, and will probably impress developers, you know, if you can sort of demonstrate that you really understand games and some of the, the underlying technology. But um, yeah, probably being aware of the surrounding culture of games, knowing about games, not sort of coming at it as someone who thinks they know it all, but you come from a completely different background and, you know, you haven't actually played any games, probably doesn't go down very well.